me talk about today's lesson, which is all on different system representations. And there's a bunch that we've talked about so far. So today's lesson is less about, there's gonna be some brand new things, but it's also really integrative. We started out for your first two semesters in circuits one and circuits two on uh, looking at circuit schematics. And then more recently, we talked about transfer functions. So kind of odd that the circuit schematic filled with op amps, capacitors, resistors, uh, inductors can be perfectly represented by a transfer function, by just a ratio of polynomials and S, but it can be. There's also the, uh, the S-plane representation. And that's when we look at the zeros and poles, the roots of the numerator and the denominator of our transfer function. Because you know, if you find the roots of the denominator and the roots of the numerator of the transfer function, within a scaling factor, that's the exact same thing. You can, you can recreate your original transfer function if you know all of its roots. So the S-plane is another one. We'll talk about the differential equation representation. And in a class about three or four lectures ago, we went over deriving the differential equation for a car suspension, which was hard, but then we converted it into a transfer, into a differential from the differential equation into the transfer function. And that was really easy. We just mapped every S into a derivative term. Here's another one, the impulse function, H of T is another completely just with that one function. Now it's a graph. We've completely encapsulated what a circuit does. And the last is something brand new you haven't seen before, which is state space. I'm putting a star next to it. This is not testable, but you're gonna see this in future classes. So I want you to have seen it at least one place. And for all these different representations, it's important to have some sort of, of mind map to combine them. And that mind map that I want you to have is that the system transfer function, H of S, that ratio of polynomials, is what's most important. It stands in the center, it's your Rosetta Stone. If you have a circuit, you know from lesson, I think it's two or three, how to convert it into a transfer function. You don't know how to convert the transfer function back out to a circuit. There's no easy way to do that. There are actually books filled with tables of different circuits to go that direction. But you know how to go from a circuit into a transfer function. And you know by taking it to Laplace transform, it's inverse Laplace transform, you know how to go from the transfer function into its impulse response. If you take the roots of the numerator and the denominator of the transfer function, where the roots of the numerator are called zeros and the roots of the denominator are called poles. And in general, those will be complex numbers. And if you graph them in the complex plane where you graph a zero with a zero and a pole with an X, kind of sort of like a, like a football diagram. But what it's meant what it's meant to be is obviously the, the zero is a zero and a pole is meant to remind you of an arrow. If you're looking head down on, on an arrow, these are the, these are the, uh, the fletches at the end. Um, then you have an S-plane diagram and you also know how to convert an H of S into its difference, into its differential equation by converting S's into derivatives. All right, so big picture, that's what this, this class is. Um, let's cover each one by one. But first, any questions about this diagram? Let's hit each of these representations on the left. Circuit schematic first. So this is just when you've got, you convert your capacitors into one over SCs, you convert your inductors into L times S's. Um, and remember, you're not gonna, if in order to get a transfer function, your transfer function is just a function of your circuit. It's not a function of your input. And in order to guarantee that it's not a function of your input, it's going to assume 
zero initial conditions. So you don't have to worry about what we did in that, that first lecture, first few lectures, about converting initial conditions, voltages across the capacitor current through the inductor into an equivalent voltage source or, um, or current source. You might need to do that if you had a real world input and a real world schematic and you need to find the real world output, but then the output is a function of that particular input. That particular input could give it initial conditions. But if we're just describing the circuit itself, we've got to assume no initial conditions. Otherwise, there'd be no way to, to uniquely characterize what that circuit is. <clears throat> 